All right. Hey, everybody. I'm Italo Brown, emergency physician, uh, also uh, social justice and health equity curriculum lead at the School of Medicine. Uh, I'm excited to be here today. Please let me know if my background is reversed. That <laughs> looks right. good. Cool. Looks good. All right. That's all you said to go into the session or to just do the introduction? No, go ahead and start your session and then we'll okay. do Katie next. Excellent. All right. Let me go ahead and pull this up. Uh, okay, one second. So can everybody see the PowerPoint okay? Yeah, everything looks great. Fantastic. So as I said, I'm Italo. I'd like to do community health uh, and community engagement. As an emergency physician, we have a unique position where we can see uh, social determinants in real time and kind of understand uh, the best ways to meet our patients where they're at. Because people tend to come to us on their worst days uh, and when they have no other options. So we're sort of, sort of uh, uniquely positioned and tools to solve some of these problems. Uh, one of my interests personally, because I come from, uh, I'm from Sacramento, California. My family's from Detroit, Michigan. Uh, every single step of my way, I've lived in uh, a, a community that's been considered marginalized or vulnerable. Uh, and I have a particular affinity for working with African-American men uh, because as we can see, there's just a variety of different health concerns that they lead uh, in terms of negative health outcomes, chronic illnesses, cancer, uh, sexual health. We have underreported mental health issues and we're subject to violence and trauma at alarming rates. Uh, my goal throughout most of my uh, career has been to not only become an advocate uh, for, for African-American men, but to be a, a translator, like a medical translator and a conduit of resources. So that kind of was the impetus initially for going into community engagement, engagement in the first place. But the question that most of uh, the specialty or specifically in medicine, we were wondering is like, how do you actually reach this population? Because it doesn't work the traditional routes, right? You can't put out uh, a message on, on some radio stations and get maximum participation. It's very difficult to get uh, adoption by communities of color, particularly because they are tight knit networks and communities. And so most people will use some common routes like faith-based organizations. Um, so churches, uh, mosques in some cases, and uh, other establishments that people from African-American cultures uh, tend to frequent or black cultures tend to frequent, like grooming establishments. So your barbershops, hair salons, nail salons, and then finally places like HBCUs uh, are a great place to get adolescent, young, uh, adult-aged African-American or uh, BIPOC individuals. Uh, we we kind of thought about this. Well, when I say we, I mean, this is like a question that emerged in the 70s and through the 80s and can continues to persist now is like, is a barbershop a legitimate space to have conversations about health issues? Um, and we know what the literature shows, right? We know that They've been doing this for a number of years. As I showed here, there, there's a study in 86 by a guy uh, who I like to call, um, we call him uh, Father Kong. My best, one of my best friends from college, his dad uh, began doing these studies in the 80s. And these are pictures of me and his son here. But he first was one of, the, he was one of the first people to really launch these barbershop based interventions. And in the 80s, started to develop and demonstrate the efficacy of these particular interventions that were embedded in uh, the safe space. Now, for those that don't understand why a Black barbershop, like why a barbershop for Black men, um, traditionally, we don't have access to safe spaces, right? Uh, this is the country club for, for Black men. This is a place where you can have a conversation about who's the best athlete. You can talk about, you know, problems with, with a loved one. You can argue over whether or not someone's vehicle is better or faster than another. And you can even talk about things like uh, the, the, the fear of getting a colonoscopy. So these studies demonstrated that in that space, you could have a variety, a range of conversation and it still be uh, effective and lead to behavior change and even um, improvement in health outcomes. 
which leads me to my, my group here. So I am not the founder or CEO. The brother that you see at the top uh, with the corny smile, as I like to call it, is Jamil Lacey. Uh, Jamil and I were, um, we lived down the hall from one another at Morehouse College. He's from Oakland, California. I was from Sacramento, California. And when you're both in Atlanta, it's like you have to stick together. Uh, it, it was a natural friendship from the beginning. And probably around 2014, he had decided he wanted to go back to medical school while I was already in medical school. His comment was essentially like, hey, I'm thinking about using this barbershop model to reach black men in Oakland. And I said, dude, just tell me when and where. We did our first activation in Oakland on New Year's Eve in 2014, going into 2015. It was a grand success. And we brought on brothers Edwin uh, and we brought our brother Brandon, who are a um, neurosurgeon and a family medicine doctor, respectively. One's in Sacramento at UC Davis. The other is in uh, UCLA and Kaiser. So as this like four-legged uh, table, we're able to do TRAP medicine, which stands for Trust, Research, Access, and Prevention. The goals are pretty, pretty straightforward, leverage our capital within the community, uh, try to improve the health statuses of black men and boys using research, using focused metrics, and to promote early detection and screening within the community as well. These are just some basic statistics here of things that we saw as clear problems that the community members faced and what, what we wanted to intervene on. And our goal is to do a longitudinal approach. So in a barbershop, you can really reach the father, the grandfather, the father, and the son all at once. Uh, so that kind of makes it unique in terms of its model. And so the messaging that we do is at the level of each one of those particular um, age ranges. Felipe, I just want to make sure I'm good on time because I know it's, it's a little... Um... Yeah, we're a little bit off time, but till 45, so you have seven minutes. Got it. All right, cool, because I only have like three slides left. Okay, perfect. <laughs> this is That's the meat of perfect. what I was trying to talk about in the first place. Yeah. So yeah. with trap medicine, um, we initially started out pre-pandemic as a very robust engine. We had uh, activations is what we call them in both the Bay Area and Los Angeles, California. Um, at the same time, I was introduced to Stanford uh, in 2019 and 2020, and I had a difficult time trying to convince people about this type of work. I mean, I remember coming into uh, contact with, well, encountering questions like, how do we know that this is going to work? Why wouldn't you just use like a, a gym or a basketball court? And I was like, well, brothers don't want to hear about, you know, their health while trying to, you know, play a game of 21. It's just not it doesn't work with this culture. And so in order to demonstrate why this was important, we launched the Survey of Health and Wellness here out of Stanford, uh, reached about 2,000 Black men uh, across the nation through social media channels and answering a survey where they basically endorsed that having conversations in barbershops uh, about sensitive topics was superior to having them in traditional healthcare or hospital settings. I have some pictures here of us having some conversations out at public events. Uh, what we tend to do, pay for the haircut of the individual, but there's a, a kind of like a, um, like a, a scavenger hunt worth of things that they have to do prior to getting the free haircut. Includes getting getting your blood pressure materials, and then you get the haircut. Uh, the one here was done at the Taste of LA or Taste of Soul in uh, Los Angeles. All right, I'm rounding out my slides. COVID uh, was an unforeseen event for us and still is. So we've had to adjust significantly. The way that we've adjusted is to be more of an information hub. We have in the beginning started having community town halls virtually, uh, both on Zoom and um, on Instagram. Then we decided to focus particularly on the barbers and giving them information. And then finally debunking COVID vaccine myths.
here's a brief picture how to improve. I got a couple more minutes. But I guess the main point that I wanted to raise was now that we are coming on the tail end of, you know, being quarantined, not quarantined, but being in um, stay at home orders, a lot of the barbers have been affected, you know, over the course of a year as 1099 employees not being in, uh, included in a lot of the legislation that created funding sources for them. We've worked with barbers uh, to try to fill PPP loans, uh, to also create a reservoir of people that they can safely cut as we still do our uh, health literacy efforts and try to raise awareness around COVID the vaccine and dispel mistrust. So that is kind of wild. So, and we'll close out on the stage back to Felipe and we can make way for Katie. Thank you, Tyler. That was a great uh, presentation. I thought we would uh, do the Q&A for you first. Um, and then we'll move on to Katie's presentation and then do Q&A for Katie um, at that point since we have some time. Um, so if you have some questions, you can type them into the chat or you can raise your hand. Um, I have a question for you though, Italo. Um, you know, information is such a hard thing to trust and to um, verify. How did you as an outsider, because it's not necessarily your community, but rather uh, you coming into a community, uh, garner that trust? That's a great question. Uh, one thing I do want to acknowledge is just because you are a person of color or you're black, you, you don't automatically have uh, credibility in every space. That's not something that is just conferred by skin color. Uh, what I do know is I've been in barbershops since I was a kid. And I know that barbershop space like the back of my hand. So I, I've been able to, to navigate comfortably into that space. The hard part is getting the buy-in from the barbers, the owners, uh, to participate in these activations. And the way we've navigated that is by simply, you know, one, stating who we are, that we have no ill intent, that we're not trying to force an agenda, uh, and being transparent about what our goals are, which is to just improve our communities by being resources as persons from communities like the ones that we're in. Uh, and then finally, what I'd say is a lot of times, you know, barbers are already doing this work. They just need the tools. You know, they're already having conversations about, you know, someone being depressed. They're already talking guys through, you know, the first time I ever saw a health intervention in a barbershop, it was uh, one of the barbers was teaching the young men how to use a latex glove as a condom. You know what I mean? So right. this conversation happened before I even, you know, knew that this was a thing. So I say that to say, Trust for me is about being open, transparent, listening to what their needs is and trying or are and trying to meet them where they're at. There, there's a question in the chat um, about uh, how long did it take you to build that relationship? Is it something that took you know a while to, to garner that relationship or was it um, garnering the support of the barber then pretty much everyone was open to you? The patrons are not that hard, right? Uh, again, it's, if you've ever been in a country club, if you've ever been in a, a kind of like unique environment where everybody feels collegial uh, just because you have the association there, it's easy to get that buy-in once you've already gotten the heads to kind of like vouch for you. So um, I, I just, I don't think it was hard once for the patrons. Now for the owners, there is a lot of uh, suspicion right? Is why are you here? What are you really trying to get after? But most of the time, they respond well to just honesty and the fact that I'm genuine with my intention. And I had a body of work to support, or, and Jamil more than anything had the body of work to support it. He didn't just start by going into a barbershop and saying, hey, uh, can we post up here? It was like, no, he started getting cuts and going back week after week after week, and then eventually saying, this is what we do. That's dedication. Um, Maria yeah. Valentina is one of our uh, pre-medical students here at Stanford and she had a question for you. Maria, you wanna read your question? Yeah, of course. Um, so thank you, Dr. Brown, for taking the time today to um, share with us um, your efforts 
And I just kind of had a general question on um, any tips you have for pre-med students to just um, be active ac advocates of racial equity and or maybe in the area students, um, how we could support your efforts or maybe even bring awareness to them. Thank Certainly. you. No, no, no problem. Um, and I will try to be quick out of respect for my colleague. So one, you can amplify. You don't have to be of the, ver of the same ethnicity to amplify issues that are relevant to that ethnicity. And you can also be a source of information that's reliable, especially in a time where vaccine hesitancy is kind of rooted in mistrust and misinformation. So being a reliable source of information is key. It, it is literally like, something I would consider a gold standard in wanting to advocate, right? The other thing that I would say very succinctly uh, is you can become a participant in it that doesn't have to be patient or forward facing. So we need help. There's always, <laughs> if you're willing to do the work for free and it's good work, someone will be more than happy to employ you to do it. And so things like the logistics, the planning, the uh, actual emailing, communication, those things are super helpful for community-based work. And so if you're ever willing to give that energy, we will find something to do with it. That, that's great advice. Um, there's questions about the COVID vaccine and how have you uh, thought about addressing information as well as delivery? Any thoughts about delivering COVID vaccine at that Let site? Let me check with Katie first. How Are you okay? You, you, you have uh, three more minutes of Q&A and, and then we'll move on to Katie. Got it, okay. Um, so I'm sorry, you said, have I thought about- Delivery of a COVID vaccine yes. and COVID information, how that's been received. So this past month, uh, March, we just started in, in Los Angeles out of Charles Drew because that's where Jamil currently is a full full tuition medical student at now. Um, <laughs> that's the, <laughs> that's the crazy awesome. thing. He starts track medicine, applies to medical school at 35 years old, gets a full tuition scholarship. Um, that's amazing. I say that to say, you know, it's never too late, especially when you yeah. know what you want to do. But uh, this past month, he down with the students at Charles Drew have been doing COVID swabs, like screening outside of barbershops. And what we've been in conversation with different companies around uh, is whether or not we can create, either bring mobile, home, mobile health units to barbershops to do COVID vaccination, or if we can actually equip, like create a model to do vaccines at the barbershop. Um, I think the ultimate goal will be to see how much barbershops can actually serve as a medical home um, or as some sort of like federally qualified health center. A variety of things can be done out of that space. The main thing is to make sure that you preserve the sanctity of it because not everybody comes to the barbershop to get a vaccine or to get uh, spoken to about vaccines. You need to have people who are willing to have the other side of the conversation for people who A, don't agree, don't understand, don't feel like it is uh, the route for them and who are just straight up critics of the entire process. So I say that to say, we do wanna do vaccines out of barbershops. There's a bunch of models to do it, still working on it. Well, thank you very much. Um, I know there's more questions on there, but we'll try to get to them at the very end if you're able to come back. Um, we'll move Certainly. on to, um, Katie Brown Johnson, uh, my co-mentor of leadership in education and advancing diversity. Um, and it kind of gets to that question that we have here. So Katie, I wanna have you um, please introduce yourself and share your thoughts. Great. First off, um, thank you so much, Dr. Brown. That was, oh, I may be muted. Nope, I'm not. Um, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Brown. That was a, a great chat, uh, a great talk and, um, I know we, you know, there's not a big clap or big applause, but it's just if everybody wants to to get right, to give some some support. Uh, the um, trap medicine sounds just amazingly cool. Um, I am going to share my screen here. Um, Practice this earlier, and then uh, make sure that I've got. I've got this ready to go. Let's see. Here we go. Okay. Can you guys see that? Yeah, it looks good. Fantastic. All right. So um, this is our community health symposium. Um, so I, I really wanted to start off this talk about um, presence for racial justice by focusing on our partner, 
clinics. And so this is a map of our partner clinics. We are really excited to um, partner with Roots Community Health Center um, in Oakland that just uh, won our award, the um, Community Engagement Award. We are um, just going up in a circle from there. We're collaborating with Culver Medical Center out of Rochester uh, with Church Health in Memphis um, and UAB University of Alabama Medicine Clinic in, um, in Birmingham, Alabama. Alabama. Um, so I just wanna say you know, many thanks to our presence for racial justice funders. Uh, there are a lot of people that have been invested in this work, including our um, team. I, I'm really excited about our team um, we've gotten to bring on new people and with COVID bring on new people from across the United States, which is new um, for, for me and for Stanford. Um, I also just wanna acknowledge that today is International Trans Day of Visibility um, and Cesar Chavez Day. And so I, I wanna dedicate this talk um, to Tony McDade um, and our patients who are trans and black. Um, and you know, my hope, uh, is that presence for racial justice really supports better care and connection for all black patients. But I also wanna acknowledge that this work is just a, a tiny, a small piece of the puzzle. Um, uh, racism is an ongoing problem and presence for racial justice it is not, you know, it's not gonna fix it. Um, and with that as a ringing endorsement, um, let's jump into presence for racial justice. So. This is a, an adaptation of Presence 5. Presence 5 is the five practices um, that are really about um, clinicians being present with their patients. Um, so Presence for Racial Justice is an adaptation of that to strategies um, that promote any racism dialogue among clinicians and also um, support better connection um, and positive practices with black patients during visits. So I'm just gonna walk quickly through our five practices and then we'll talk more about the community engagement piece, which I, I think is what you guys are here to hear about. Um, prepare with intention is our, our first practice. Are you prepared for a meaningful interaction? Um, and some of our literature review on this, one, race is a social construct. I think we heard about that in our um, in our keynotes, um, and then also that there's this um, uh, evidence that a sustained practice of self-reflection can reduce bias and racism in clinical settings. Uh, and what we've heard from providers when we've had conversations around this um, is that prepare with intention. One of the things that people have suggested is signage to promote racial justice. So um, you know, thinking about who are the people that are represented, what, what um, different skin colors, different abilities, et cetera, are represented um, in your clinic. Um, and then we've also heard about things like signs that uh, to say that immigration or law enforcement would not be called in the clinic. Um, and then I, I think one of the most innovative signs that I have not gotten a chance to, um, to see yet is one that says, we see color and then kind of really steps through you know, we, we see difference here and, um, and we want to provide equitable care. So listen intently and completely is our, our second practice. Um, the background on this is, um, you know, patients, black patients experience shorter visits, um, physicians speak faster and verbally dominate um, conversations. And one of the things, again, that we've heard from our conversations with providers is to really, around listen, is to take what your patient is saying seriously um, and, and know that some patients just need to come in to talk sometimes. That, that is the intervention sometimes. Three is agree on what matters most. How can you and your patient be on the same team? Um, again, the literature shows that clinicians vary in uh, question in, in a lot of different um, communication um, and treatment decisions based on patients racial identity. Um, alarmingly, um, minority children are more likely to be reported 
for child abuse and inappropriately referred to child protective services. Um, and black patients report uh, worse outcomes on nonverbal communication. So our, I, I think our, the practice that I am really interested in, again, and I'm just highlighting one practice because we'll, we spend hours uh, talking to providers about this, but uh, providers have reported, reported that they, they specifically coach their black patients about how to advocate for themselves when referred to specialists. So you're gonna go see this person, you're gonna schedule an appointment at the beginning of the week, not at the end. Um, we've also heard in our patient interviews that the patients need to advocate for themselves to get the same care as other patients. Our fourth practice is connect with the patient's story. Um, how can you combat anti-Black racism in your patient's health journey? This is really, there's evidence that eliminating language um, that demonstrates preconceptions can lead to improved documentation, history taking, and understanding. Um, and then understanding the history of racism can combat anti-Black racism. Uh, and we've heard much the same thing, um, you know, avoiding terms like non-compliant in the EMR. Um, I try to avoid uh, vaccine hesitancy um, and instead talk about vaccine deliberation as a, as a way to make sure that we're acknowledging um, patients' agency. And then our, our last practice is exploring emotional cues. How can you learn from your patients' emotions and support them through experiences with racism? So the, the literature on this is not good. Clinicians block discussion of emotional issues more with black patients. Um, and on the flip side, clinician um, attempts to uh, elicit and identify emotional cues is associated with greater status, patient satisfaction even when the clinician's wrong. Um, you know, so clinician, you say, it, it seems like you're sad. Um, and the patient says, no, I'm not sad. I have this other feeling, um, but that, that still um, uh, corresponds with greater patient satisfaction, adherence and learning. Um, and I, I think what we've seen in, in this space from our providers we've talked to is ideas to pay attention to what patients are wearing to start conversations around racism and bias. So if somebody's wearing a Breonna Taylor mask, you know, you know tell me more uh, about that. I, I know about Breonna Taylor, but what, is, what does this mean to you? Um, that, that kind of thing to, to connect with patients. So I'll switch it and talk about our, um, our community advisory board. So uh, again, um, you know, the upside of, of COVID here is that we were able to engage a remote advisory board with 17 community advisory board members from our four partner clinic clinics. Um, and our participants have met virtually, uh, I think it's more like six times over six months um, with one hour, um, uh, meetings and coffee chats. I think, you know, one of the things that we've done um, on, on the back end we, um, is to, to make sure that we're getting feedback at each advisory board meeting, um, analyzing that feedback and then adjusting our practices. So we've asked about, uh, ask advisory board members, has, have we met expectations? Are they feeling successful in their role? Is there a personal benefit for them? Do they feel patients and clinicians are contributing equally? Um, do they feel that key decisions incorporate stakeholder involve, involvement? Do they feel trust in partnerships? Um, and we have, um, and, and we've, you know, it hasn't been all roses. Um, we, I'm gonna go through what we've learned next, but, but we really had an opportunity to, to give this information and incorporate it. So we've done a few things to address power dynamics. We've definitely cut down on the number of Stanford members that are in the advisory board meetings to make the board more approachable. We're also conducting one-on-one -on -one calls with each member to address questions and concerns. And then we reiterate research goals, the goal for the current meeting, meeting and then the outline of how members are contributing to the goal. And I'm, I'm pretty close to wrapping up Felipe, so I'm keeping an eye on time. Um, our, our other lessons learned, you know, in thinking about um, a strong infrastructure for um, community partnerships, 
really, you know, multiple contacts at each community partner, prepare the partnership for an inevitable personnel shift. Um, you know, the, the virtual opportunities that have opened up with COVID really allow for expanded geographic diversity, um, but they still pose challenges. You know, if somebody doesn't have a smartphone or a computer, it's really difficult to get them um, completely involved in, um, you know, in, in our board. Um, we want to use, we've used uh, more discussion. We've moved from uh, more slides to more discussion, uh, which is helpful. And then the other two things that I think I've reiterated. So um, thank you so much for listening. I think, you know, again, um, Stanford is building longer term connections with Roots um, Community Clinic in Oakland, really uh, around uh, research, clinical opportunities, um, for learners and then the actual practice as well. So I'm excited that we are a part of that. Thank you, Katie. I will. That, was, that was very informative for us to hear about, you know, the, the different five steps that we can do to be present. I mean, I think that that's applicable to all doctors and maybe even to all conversations. Um, what, are, what are some of the things that um, you have done now that COVID is here in telemedicine? Uh, have you seen that those uh, five things is applicable um, to be present? Yeah, so we, I pulled this. Um, we have also done a, um, a telemedicine, a telepresence five um, oh. that's not quite as, it, it, you know, it, it's not as um, extensively researched. It's not as community-based um, as presence for racial justice. Presence for racial justice is really like a, a, a big project. Um, our telepresence slide, we went back to the literature and, and did a quick review. And the kinds of things, I'll share a link in just a second, the kind of things that we were able to pull out are things like, you know, standing up and taking a deep breath in between visits Ooh. to prepare, um, uh, leaning forward and staying in the frame um, for listen intently and completely. Um, pausing before responding to um, to somebody to account for for lags and um, and prevent interruptions. Um, and then there's great options, you know, if people aren't using a background to be able to say, tell me about what's on the, you know, that's a really lovely painting. Tell me about, you know, what's on the wall. To, you know, if it if there's a, a conversation around diet, can you take me to your refrigerator? Let's take a look at it together. Um, and then as far as emotion is concerned, I think the main thing that we've got is like, a, you know, if, if big emotions come up, you just can kind of, you know, hold still, take some time. And, and this is kind of the best that, that you can't hand people tissues, unfortunately. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for sharing that. And that, that's great that you've been able to adapt some of the presence five uh, to uh, the telemedicine and our current environment. Um, previously, there was a question from Hannah um, asking about if there's any difference in fostering trust for clinical care compared to community research partnerships. It seems like yours transcends both of those where you're doing research as well as, you know, it's improving clinical care. Um, but has there been any pushback when you kind of approached it more as a research uh, initiative? I, I wouldn't say that there's been pushback in approaching it as a research initiative. Um, I will say I think we've learned different things. I mean, the we're for presence for racial justice. We're not addressing the pipeline issue of uh, you know of concordance of there being more black doctors. Um, at, at, but for our research. We are really intentionally um, considering um, expertise. It is saxophone hour in my house. That's my 10 year old. Um, we're intentionally considering um, uh, lived experience and um, expertise in racial justice and, and um, broadening our team to make sure that we're, um, that there's not anything that we're missing along the way. So I hope that answers that. Yeah, no, no, thank you. Um, there's also a question that Dachin uh, had, which was um, whether or not wanting to be teaching tools as well. So not just research, but more 
perspective of uh, medical students. Um, have you seen that in the community, feeling like they're being teaching tools? That's 100% where we're headed. So uh, my colleague, Dr. Mega Shankar, has really been leading the Presence for Racial Justice Med Ed, um, where we've got a couple of um, grant proposals out um, and are, you know, are, are definitely hoping not only to expand into uh, medical education, but also graduate medical education. I actually think we're going to get to graduate medical education first. Um, and I, I think the the difference there, you know, is that we do a little more didactic right up front if we're thinking about med med ed versus with providers. We may just jump into to discussion and content right off the bat. Right. And Jonathan, um, can you uh, unmute yourself and maybe share your comment and perspective? Yeah. So I'm mean, uh, um, I'm Jonathan Shaw. I'm direct our uh, well, I'm part of the presence team, so in the research, but uh, the author, really it was a separate hat from developing the community partnerships. And so as we've developed the community partnerships over the past couple of years, once you have the trust, it's matured to where the right research and the right integration of learners comes later. Um, I think it's part of it's undoing some history where the academic partner only shows up when they want to push students out to a site or do research with your, you know, with the patient population. So for example, Roots, we we have had three faculty who are part of um, the Roots clinical endeavor and building programs there. And that then uh, allowed the, the opportunity for when we had this very, you know, patient and provider focused intervention to be a partner. Um, same with the original presence work was at my clinic at Ravenswood um, because it wasn't you know, that, that was a nice example because it wasn't actually even touching the patients except indirectly and, you know, as if doctors do a better job being present, that benefits them. So I, I think that's really important. It was echo, I'm just echoing what was said by our initial keynote speakers that coming to the partner first with, you know, um, generosity and, and meeting their needs. And then later, once you have the trust, you can say, okay, here's, here's some opportunities that needs to be really done well, but this, this sort, these are great examples of research that, you know, we all think we should be better at being present and, and anti-racist. So, so that's the context there. And so, um, I mean, I think one of the great things is that, you know, the learners often are lead us and are ahead of us, the faculty in terms of their passion and dedication to the mission. So, so yes, you know, there was this mistrust in the past of some community clinics of just having random Stanford students who didn't get it coming there, but I think we have a very different student body now and, and there are lots of opportunities. So I'm happy to talk to any students who are interested about opportunities to get up there and, and the, our community partners um, yeah. help with the mission. That'd be great. Um, one of the things that I hear a theme coming through is trust um, and building trust. You know, Tyler Brown talked about trust at the barbershop. We're talking about trust in the clinic and not feeling like we're just using or uh, you know, researching these communities without giving anything back, you know, but at the time now we're in COVID, we have uh, racial injustices and, you know, we were talking about by our speaker series that it should not just be one-on-one, -on -one, but maybe a systemic change that needs to occur. In terms of when we're trying to create that trust, how long do we wait before we start studying to make sure that what we're doing is actually effective and we're actually doing what we intend to do so that research still continues but do you wait a year or do you wait two years or how was it for you, Katie, to determine that? I'm, I'm so biased. Um, I'm a, a mixed methods and qualitative researcher. Uh, <laughs> and so you, you start right away. Anytime you're talking to people, you're, you're talking to stakeholders. Um, I mean, we're doing, maybe we're a, a little intense on this, but for presence for racial justice, when we've talked to experts, we've consented them um, and uh, and captured you know um, qualitative information. When we've done our um, advisory board meetings, you know we have stipends for people. We record the meetings, um, so we're we're really looking at. I also do implementation science, and so we're looking at the the feasibility, the acceptability, some of the the basics. Um, right off the bat and building towards 
um, you know, something that that um, maybe a little, you know, higher level of, of evidence. But I think with qualitative data, you know, right off the bat, you can be chatting with people and um, and have it be structured enough to um, give you some good insights and contribute to the field. Yeah, I think um, uh, Tapita had a, a follow-up question to that, which was when are you primarily focused on African-American uh, relative to care and treatment, or is it inclusive of people of color? And there's a follow-up question about are the patients being asked about their level of feeling inclusiveness? So in terms of are you assessing to make sure how they're feeling and how they're doing and opting out of research if possible? Yeah, so we we are not focused just on African Americans. We are focused on Black patients, and that is a, a broader. We, we took, you know, we had long conversations about the term to use, actually, um, you know, to make sure it's really African diaspora. Um, and um, and the second question, yes. So a, a couple of things that we've done specifically, uh, and specifically in the context of um, uh, George Floyd's murder and Black Lives Matter this summer, we pause um, frequently in our interviews to say, you know, let me know if you don't want to answer the next question. You know, tell me if you, uh, you know, we can stop anytime. Basically, um, we're in intentionally. Um, not just uh, not pushing the research agenda, but really actively stepping back from it and letting our participants lead as much as possible. And we also um, have created a large list of free or low cost um, mental health uh, uh, support resources that as much as possible are, are targeted to um, black uh, patients and, and, you know, subgroups of black black women, black men, you know, black transgender patients. So um, I think those are kinds of the ways that we've addressed that. And I'd be happy to share that list with people. That's not something we've published, but I maybe I can give that to you, Felipe, and and you could send it to folks. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, and Dechen uh, has a comment there about mommy vans. Do you want to share, Dechen? Oh, hi. <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Um, so in the 90s, I worked at the perinatal outreach program and women were taking three buses to get to OB clinics here in Yon. And uh, we got funding to develop the mommy van, which was an RV that was outfitted with um, a couple of exam rooms, ultrasound room. We had nutritionists, community outreach workers, we had nurses and physicians. It was awesome. And, uh, we, and, and actually the adolescent van came after that, but somehow the, I don't know, the funding fell apart for it after a while. And then community clinics were opened up, but for OB care, but there wasn't the trust in the providers at that point. They were more like county providers and we had developed something really wonderful. So anyway, I still have pictures of the mommy van. It was awesome. <laughs> well, we have uh, 20 seconds left. I just want to thank everyone for